Good people, welcome back to the Onyx Report, Black Masculinist News for the day. Hope all is well. Uh, shout out to everybody that came through early. What's up, good brother Damon? Clutch and stick in the house. Barry, Prince, what's going on? Brother Truth, a number of people already in here. Aaron, what's up? Layman's Journal, shout out to Layman's Journal. Y'all make sure you support Layman Jur- Layman's Journal's channel. Uh, up and coming, doing beautiful work over there. Uh, particularly check out his Black Panther series, but, you know, check out all of them. Uh, shout out to Fred, uh, Ken, going on. Happy New Year to everybody. Kiel, what's up? Will, Outlaw, Winston, what's the word? So, yeah, man, I'm just going to get in a little quick hit because I am uh, masterminding in the kitchen. I'm trying to show my son a few things before he bounces out of here. So we're working on his, uh, his little... Uh, curriculum as it were when it comes to the culinary arts but you know on the real though one of the things i am doing and i have been doing for probably the last 15 years is um i've written up a recipe book that i plan to you know give him and let him build on but that way he can continue to cook the things that he enjoyed i'm cooking the things my mother used to cook so on and so forth some of the grandparents cooking is in there and it's a family kind of legacy so he can pick up and run with it um So, you know, something to keep in mind for those of you who might be interested in that, that, particularly if you enjoy cooking. What's up to Hootie? Uh, Shout out to Electrician480 with the uh, $20 hit. Appreciate that. Says, Happy New Year's, my brother, and support Black Male Media. Indeed. Appreciate that. Happy New Year's to all of you. Like, share, subscribe, join, and donate. Support the channel if you will. We can continue to bring you independent Black Male thought. So please make sure you support Go ahead and get this on the screen for those of you who might benefit from it. You can see the various ways that you can help. Send me a uh, uh, do the super chat right here on YouTube, Venmo, PayPal, Cash App. Uh, you can even hit the pitch, Patreon where you can support the show, the Onyx Report here on YouTube. You can also support uh, the Institute for Black Male Studies and or the Onyx Report, um, which gives you an opportunity to support the uh, TV network. You know, so you can go there, check it out on iPhone, Android, Amazon Fire TV, Roku. Yeah, download it there. It's all good. So support if you will. All right. So tonight, I'll talk a little bit about sexual objectification. And part of the reason for this is because uh, not only did I run across an article that I thought was important to look at, but it also in many ways sets the context for the black male experience. You know, where we find ourselves in many respects uh, is a product of this. And it's, it's a trip. I've talked about this before. I remember having casual conversations with some of my uh, feminist uh, peers. And I remember one in particular, I remember she laughed and told me black men don't know anything about sexual objectification. And I thought that was really interesting. That tells you how blind people are, even in the academy, about how men are perceived and treated, most particularly black men. You know, it's not an accident that black men have been hypersexualized to the extent that we have. And more than that, it's even happened within our own community. Right. So you hear all these conversations about how black men engage sexuality. Right. And it's particularly as it relates to women. If you, if you like light skinned women, if you like dark skinned women, if you like them thick and curvy, if you like them, whatever. Those things are highly criticized and considered misogynist. But when you hear about conversations about black men, their penises, their height, you know, whether or not they're fit, whether or not they're not fit. Uh, what people want to do to them, there's no conversation. Now, there is academic work around how black men is, are perceived by other groups, most particularly by white society. We're going to look a little bit into that tonight, but not enough conversation about what goes on. And I want brothers to be able to articulate and, and, and understand their own situation because this has, this twists and turns and it can come back at you in ways you don't even see coming because the sexualization part of it is part 
the, the hypersexualization, the sexual objectification of black males, though that's part of the dynamic, but it can also come back around to you, not only as sexual attraction, but also as uh, being considered a threat. Right? I've worked on job sites where in the, in the same vein, I've had supervisors that really at one point or another went from flirting to requiring sex from me in order for me to keep my job. But it also turned in other environments into sexual threat, meaning that the people involved considered me a sexual threat, even though I said nothing about sex. I didn't hint. I didn't flirt. I didn't do any of that. But my perceived you know, persona, my, my, my standing, you know, six foot two, 300 plus, so on and so forth. The perception was that I wanted to do something to women in my environment. Even if I did nothing to stimulate that thought, even if I said nothing, I didn't do anything. And yet that was the perceived, you know, idea, right? That I'm a sexual threat. And that comes out of a long history of black men being perceived as sexual threats. It's not new. So when it happens to you at a job site or wherever in a social situation as a black male, you find that these things aren't accidental and they don't come out of anywhere. There's a context for them, right? And so that's one of the things we're going to kind of delve into a little bit, the way these kinds of sexual uh, you know, perceptions about black men can turn around and impact us. So let's look at the first piece for tonight. This one you can find on nypost.com, right? This is dated January 2nd, yesterday. Right. Ex NFL star Tail Johnson claims racist CEO urged him to sleep with co workers. Lawsuit. Right. And you can see the images there. Uh, let's go through a little bit of this. Let me see if I can make it a little larger for you. CEO of New York based Metaverse company has been accused of sexually harassing a pair of African American subordinates, including a former NFL player who claims she subjected him to bizarre come ons and prodded him to have sex with co workers. K.O. Johnson, former tight end for the Oakland Raiders, who also played balls and undergraduate at Stanford University, claims Every Realm CEO Janine Yorio presided over a toxic work environment where she made lewd references about employees' sex lives as well as racial slurs directed at Black employees, including one remark threatening to trade Johnson if he didn't perform in his job. In a lawsuit filed in Manhattan federal court against Yorio and Every Realm, whose backers include the Silicon Valley venture firm, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, and which has tapped celebrity uh, endorsers, including Paris Hilton, Will Smith, and The Weeknd, Johnson also alleges that he was pressured into sexual harassing games in which, in which co-workers and clients were encouraged to sleep with each other. Go there. Uh, in March, Johnson alleged that Yoriel told him about a sex-related game that she encouraged employees to play during a business trip to the SXSW South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas. KYP, which stands for Know Your Personnel, and KYC, Know Your Client, were euphemisms for having sex or hooking up with coworkers and business partners, according to the lawsuit. This is interesting, right? Because what we're talking about here is even in a corporate setting, the use of black males as a part of the brand of the company, right? To sell, you know, whatever's being opted for and using your masculinity to do it. This is a white woman that is engaging in this. So Yoriel told Johnson that the way to pay the game uh, was to get laid by a coworker on a business trip, the lawsuit alleges. She then allegedly asked him if he would be doing any KYP. Johnson was taken aback by Yoriel's suggestion and politely informed her that he was already really close with someone the lawsuit states. That same evening, Johnson alleged that Yoriel was testing the waters with him after she came to his hotel room in Austin and insinuated in no uncertain terms that she believed he would cheat on his girlfriend to participate in the company's KYP game, the lawsuit alleges. Oh, I'm liking the fact that brothers are becoming more litigious. There's Yorio there, apparently, right? Johnson also alleged that Yorio made offensive jokes about his girlfriend's menstrual cycle and referred to him as a stupid black person the whitest black person, other slurs that Yorio is alleged to have hurled at Johnson, including, uh, which looks, <laughs> yep, there it is, dick, big swinging dick, and effing dick. I've been saying for years, and I've been teaching it in my courses, the way black men are perceived are essentially as what I call weaponized fallacies. That's basically how we're perceived. Um, the weaponized component has to do with the fear of physical threat. But other than physical threat, the other dynamic that, you know, kind of overarchingly frames black males is 
you know, large phallus, right? Which in turn, you know, implies sexual prowess and so on and so forth. Now, at the end of the day, when you're objectified in this manner, it's the way that this can come back at you in different ways that can be dehumanizing. And, and this is an instance where Johnson, you know, definitely felt dehumanized. Elsewhere, William Kerr, the company's general counsel, once referred to celebrity hotel heiress Paris Hilton and every realm investor who has been photographed with Yorio at prior events as a night in Paris. The title of a revenge porn video that was leaked to the Internet in 2004, uh, according to the suit. Johnson, whose job required managing, ah, I hate this, I mean, uh, managing celebrity accounts, including Hilton's, was horrified that in order to carry out his job duties, he was made to listen to the derogatory commentary and sexual harass, harassing nickname from Kerr, the suit claims. Right? Post has sought comment from Hilton. Uh, Johnson claims he was fired after he blew the whistle on a cryptocurrency-based gambling scheme involving NFT um, playing cards of professional soccer players. According to Johnson, the scheme involved a cryptocurrency version of fantasy sports in which users would buy packs of NFTs representing professional soccer playing cards. Users would enter cryptocurrency into a pool and then win prize money if their NFT playing cards performed better than the other players' NFTs. According to the lawsuit, Johnson reasonably believed that the scheme would violate numerous New York and federal laws since randomizing the pack of cards would quality or um, would quality or would probably would qualify as a game of chance and thus be illegal, according to the filing. Johnson, who says his sports connections include an active business relationship with former NBA star Yao Ming, claims that his proposal to forge a relationship between every realm in the NFL was intentionally sabotaged by Yorio and her executive team as revenge for his blowing the whistle on the crypto gang scheme. After he reported his concerns to an executive, the NFT project was scrapped and Yorio soured on Johnson, who eventually ended up in her doghouse, according to court, court papers. When reached by the Post, a spokesperson uh, person for every realm denied the allegations, calling them lies. Right? There you go. As we've stated in our court filings, this employee worked at the company for only three months and was terminated for poor performance, expense account abuse, and falling asleep on the job. The spokesman said in a statement, every realm was alleged, uh, had also alleged in a, a legal filing that Johnson openly and routinely disparaged the mother of his child and demanded that every realm pay a portion of his wages in cash to avoid garnishment for child support payments. The company said that it refused Johnson's alleged demand. So a lot going on there. A lot of accusations being thrown both ways. But one of the things you can definitely see in this dynamic is that when it does actually come to black males being used as a sexual entity, especially in terms of furthering a business venture, it's hard to say how many people are, would actually be upset about that. Right? How many people would take him seriously is the question. And what's been the legacy of that? Men can talk about for decades being sexually harassed at the job, black men in particular. But how often were we taken seriously and how many men even thought to take it uh, to the lawsuit le level based on how they perceive, how black men are perceived, right? For the most part, sexual harassment is still perceived as a primarily female engagement. But this is, this is an example of how a white woman in power might be using her power to sexually objectify a black man. But let's look at another example having to do with white men objectifying black men. This is an article you can find on chill.us. Um, it's entitled The Sexual Objectification of Black Men from Maplethorpe to Calvin Klein. Right? This is where you see the thumbnail image come from. And this particularly deals with gay white men's perceptions of black men. Right? In our current moment, there has been considerable debate around what is frequently referred to as sexual racism. Now, I should say this is, let me see, didn't have a date. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Uh, March 2nd, 2018. So this is about four or five years old. So we're talking about sexual racism. This is a term I used to use before I started talking more specifically about anti-Black misandry, right? But sexual racism, a term that reacts to the romantic and erotic rejection of men of color by white gay men. That's not how I use the term, but that's how they're using it here. These discussions described often in detail the various forms of emotional injury in the digital realm of dating and hookup apps that manifest the kind of modern day Jim Crowism black gay men know as well as anyone that the sexual liberation of white gay men has not made them more sensitive to racism. Uh, and it continues from there. However, what's less discussed now is the sexual objectification of black men by white gay men. 
these debates seem to explode around the photographer Robert Robert Maplethorpe and his images of black men in the 1980s at the height of the cultural wars, even as his work was championed and defended uh, by the white art world for its transgressive themes. There were others who took issue with his depiction of black men. This was not simply an argument between those who favored censorship and those who favored free expression uh, or those who were appalled by sexually provocative images and those who weren't. This was a debate that centered around race and power, art and representation, and it was a debate led by black queer men. This uh, is also a debate we continue to have to this day. So um, I'm gonna put all the links for these articles in the chat. You can go through this. Now, this was a longer piece. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, especially since I just read one, but there is a portion that I do wanna fixate on a little bit, this last couple paragraphs. It says, uh, let me see, where, where's the part that I wanted to start with? Um, okay, no, no image speaks to this point about objectification better than one of Maplethorpe's most famous and certainly most infamous images, man in polyester suit. The model was Milton Moore wearing a tight suit with his long black uncircumcised penis yes, dangling out of the zipper. So this is the depiction of black men in white gay art. Uh, writer Edmund White, in defense of Maplethorpe, argues that many of his models, including Moore, were in fact his lovers, and Moore in particular requested that his face and penis not appear in the same image. However, having sex with black men does not exclude a white man from racism, and in this case, Maplethorpe, black men were not only a fetish, but racism itself. Right? So again, we're looking at sexual objectification, and we're looking at how it applies to black men, despite that people generally don't talk about it along those lines. So we saw an example involving a, a fairly empowered white woman. We're also seeing an example with a fairly powerful um, gay white man. Let's look at another example. This is, this is a Twitter person who apparently is named P. Dior. Appreciate uh, D Remedy for that support. Thank you very much. Okay. You see the image here. These are a couple of tweets that uh, I was recently sent um, involving some posts on her page. And it had to do with the image of this young man laying in bed, this little boy, uh, with a Mickey Mouse doll. Right? And if you can see some of the captions, uh, these were written supposedly by black women on Twitter. Right, you know, and then the first one here on the left reads, ooh, his ass can get it. And then the caption uh, by K beneath that, man, I can't breathe. Got to delete this app ASAP. Um, little, you know, gonna get effed. You know, you see the kind of comments being sent here, in here. And then it's dismissingly kind of looked at like, y'all act like she was serious, right? But these kind of sexual comments made around a little boy. Because at the end of the day, can you imagine a five-year-old girl, particularly a five-year-old black girl, and a group of black men talking about what kind of, what, what kind of sexual acts or uh, the fact that they're sexually attracted to her at all? Can you imagine how that would be perceived? And let me say, let me say something real quick. Here's the thing. I've actually witnessed women talk about boys in this way. Even when I was young, I've seen this. But the thing I find interesting about it, if you go to a barbershop or any location for where you find a group of men and a group of men are talking about a little girl, first of all, I've never seen it happen, but I can tell you this much. It would not shock me if a man did try to do this and got his ass beat by a group of grown men in the same room. You're talking about a five-year-old girl in a highly sexualized way. No, I don't see that. I don't see that. But some people feel like they can get on Twitter and post comments like this, right? And even the comment right here by YRN Sean says, see, this is why I hate the internet. Let it would have been a little girl. Everyone uh, had uh, flipped the whole world upside down. Y'all mad, weird, and it's, and it's sickening, right? Here's another series of responses. Little dude gonna be hell, right? On the left, on the right, him and his daddy can run a train on me, not even go back. When he get a little older, I'm gonna just tell him we fake brothers. This is what we're talking about. Here's a little more. 
ain't nothing sick about what I said, so I don't give an F. He ain't going to remember anyway running the train on me. I'm going to just lie and say he my fake brother. Y'all some Karens. That's what we're talking about. This is being joked about publicly on Twitter. This is ridiculous. The sexual objectification of black men and black boys, hence the video's title, Black Males, is something that goes on every day, but it flies under the radar. And most of us, even the men that experience it, even the boys that experience it, don't process it as such. Because when society was sold the idea of sexual objectification, it was so closely tied to women and girls, we didn't really know it attached to anybody else or that it could. And to this day, when it happens to boys, in one ear, out the other. And yet the research shows that the damage it does, particularly to boys who are sexually harassed, um, sexually impacted, uh, violated, the same, the damage is the same as it is for young girls. There are no facilities. There's no prominent research behind this. Again, you got to refer to, and I keep, I've said this anytime this subject comes up, but look at Tommy Curry and Ebony Utley's paper, She Touched Me. And what they do in the first half of the paper, before they interview grown men who are talking about their early experiences of being sexually violated as boys, because the you know sexual debut of black boys is somewhere between 10 and 12, right? Which is the youngest age of sexual debut, meaning that they are introduced to sex directly younger than any other demographic, including black girls. And often they're introduced by older girls and grown women. And you don't got to just look to celebrities, but you can find a whole bunch of black male celebrities that can talk about those experiences from Tyler Perry to, uh, oh goodness, so many, it's ridiculous. Talk about these experiences all the time. Sugar Ray Leonard, you can go back decades. You can go back generations and find this. This is common, but the reason it's so common with black males is because it's not a thing that people have a problem with. So it goes unchecked. Grown women can talk about boys and do things to boys. And again, very little is said because we accept it. The men have learned to look at this as a rite of passage. If pressed hard enough, older women will talk about it too as a rite of passage and then turn around and shame men for accepting it. We're going to ignore the fact that many of us were taught to accept it, but we'll leave that to the side. Well, here we're looking at three different instances with a white woman, a gay white man, and a black woman, all of whom objectify on sexual terms the black male body. The uproar I'm starting to see in response to some of this is coming from black men. And I'm finally glad to see it because I wasn't sure if I ever would. Yeah, KJ, turn on Antoine Fisher. But notice, when I ask about how many movies you can find that deal with black males being sexually objectified and, and molested and, you know, assaulted on sexual terms, the one film I hear we bring up is Antoine Fisher, which is good. But it's, the reason we do is because there aren't that many, at least not that many that are popular. You might find some independent films here and there. I ran across an independent film. And I will say this about BET. Much as I've not been a fan of a lot of what they've done, there is a burgeoning private, I don't want to say private, but burgeoning independent film net, net, you know, tradition that you know one can see. That's you know, a bunch of black made films starring black actors and black directors. You know, you can see a lot of those films. They tend to cater to women, they tend to defer to women's interests more so than men, but it's there. And I did once watch a movie where they talked about they showed a black prisoner who got out of jail and was trying to help his community. And at one point, his, um, I think his PO, or is that what they call him? Uh, she, you know, it was a black woman. She required sex in order for him to get a good report or else she threatened to send him back to jail. And he actually had his boy come over to do the deed the one night she finally demanded it, if I remember correctly. And it's the same brother that played um, in power, played the lead in power. His name escapes me at the moment, but y'all know who he is. Um, he actually played the character. This is before I think he got big um, was one of his minor roles. But, you know, I kind of tripped up on that film by accident. But for the most part, you know, tend to see a lot of films that are highly popularized that deal with this issue, especially films that target, um, you know, how it happens in the community. Yeah, Gear Amari. Thank you. Yeah, he played Ghost. Amari Hardwick. Thank you, King. 
you can find a film, but I don't remember the name of the film. This was a couple years ago. I just tripped on it one day. I think it was um, it was either BET or what's the other black channel? But anyway, yeah, he played his, his, his you know the main character's boy, and because the main character didn't want to go back to jail, but at the same time he didn't want to be stuck in this sexual contract with his PO, he brought in his boy. His boy hit it, and the implication is he was able to stay out of jail. That was the one time I actually saw it brought up, but it was brought up so casually. It wasn't even the main narrative of the film. There was a whole nother narrative. It was just a mini side story. And it only, you know, was a few minutes long and then it moved on to the next thing. I thought it was interesting because in other settings, that would have been the whole focus of the movie. Think about it. You have a female prisoner that gets out of jail. She has a male, you know, PO or whatever you call him. And he requires sex in order for her to stay out of jail. That would have been the whole focus of the movie. For black men, I'm telling you, it happened so quick and toward the end of the movie, if it didn't happen at all, it didn't affect the main story in, in the slightest. Yeah, so um, I wish I could tell you the name because he wasn't the main character, but you can go look up uh, on IMDb, Omari Hardwick, and you can look at some of his earlier roles before Ghost, and you'll probably find it. Uh, somebody in here might already know the name of it, but it was a small independent, looked like an independent black made film, not highly budgeted. Um, yeah, um, I don't know how to pronounce it. L L N Y R N. I guess that's, I don't know, New York nurse. I don't know what it is. Moonlight suggested moonlight. Yeah. There were some implications in moonlight. Um, right here and there. Shout out to Ian Graves. What's up, man? Good to see you in here. Stardust. What's up? Car. Appreciate that support. You know, but these are the kind of subjects we need to talk about because Again, I want brothers, especially young men, maybe even little boys who are in these situations to be able to identify what the hell is happening to them and to call it out. Because if this mess is happening and it's unchecked, I mean, we know how these things go. We know how they're received. We've seen it over and over again. And yet we're comfortable dismissing it. We're comfortable. And I think the biggest example that I show in my classes, uh, let me see, because I'm not going to be here long, but this is one. And it's not that he was, uh, he's the only one by any measure, but the conversation is so in your face um, that I was shocked that it took place. Let me see if I can find it uh, real quick here. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Yeah, hold on. Let's see. Let's see if I can bear with me. I didn't even think about this beforehand, so I'm gonna see if I can do it on the spot. Um, and it, it actually, when I first started showing this film, uh, this clip, I showed it because I remember I had students that didn't believe that black boys. It experienced sexual violation. Yeah, Chris Brown is another who's talked about it, um, being sexualized at a young age. Uh, let me see, it's not coming up. Mm. There we go, there we go. Mm. <laughs> I think I usually have it clipped at a very specific part. All right, let me check one other thing. But I would urge you, and I've done this with my son as well. We have these conversations uh, fairly early because one of the things that I didn't want to, to happen to him that happened to me was I didn't want him to have experiences he couldn't explain to me and not tell me as a result. That's one of the things I didn't want to happen. And it can, when you don't, you know, when you're dealing with a child, especially who doesn't, have a frame of reference who doesn't know what these things are um yeah i found it but i don't know if it'll play hmm okay let me see something i don't know what to okay could you guys just hear that sound just real quick I'll, maybe because i could you could you guys hear that what i just played for a quick second let me know in the chat if you could hear that at all. You could. All right. So, so here's the thing. Um, 
Hold on. Almost there, y'all. I gotta be careful because uh sometimes some of these uh people who you know can get pretty serious about when you use any of their stuff. So this is D. Ray Davis, comedian D. Ray Davis, and he's gonna talk about his experience as a young boy. Listen to this clip. I don't know what to, I'll, maybe because I've been put in a situation and people will always say that to me, you don't know what I felt like to, I've been as a young guy, my mother's friends who were, my mother was involved in a lot of stuff, but I've had older women who thought I wasn't being parented correctly slightly try to take advantage of me and not slightly have taken advantage right, of me. You lost your virginity to two 30 year olds. Yeah. The same time. Yeah. Two ugly, <laughs> horrible looking women. And you were, uh, I, I, what was I? You were how old? 11, 11. Now I want to, I want to, and this is something I do in my class because I wish I could show you the video, but he's actually entertaining Vlad as he's telling the story about probably one of the most impactful experiences of his young life. He's entertaining him. Vlad is laughing. The cameraman is laughing. He's got a smile on his face in a way, but something even my most ardent students would have to admit at some point in the video, you could see in his face, he's not over it. He's not over it. And he still grapples with it. And even though he's talking about it, right? Imagine a woman entertaining the camera crew and the host about her own sexual violation and nobody say anything about it but this clip has come come and gone and i really haven't seen any any of the the kind of attention i thought it would de it deserves but i'm gonna continue it it's, it's not that long but here we go going to 12 i had no hair on me right i had no i remember i remember not having and and it was disgusting and to this day it's difficult for women to get me to go down it's difficult. The girls that have had it, um, you're welcome. But it's hard. <laughs> it's hard for me. It's hard for me to go down, man, because I'm like, I remember what it was like down there. It was like, <laughs> it was like a scary jungle. <laughs> it was a terrible place to be. It was a terrible place to be, and they were like taking turns. I was up for. I was just happy to be up. And um, it made my it made my Kool Aid taste different. Now, I just pull out that one minute clip to show in class. I think that that particular whole interview is probably about nine minutes or so. Um, and as a matter of fact, I'll actually put it in the description box so you guys can, if need be, uh, check it. Or at least I'll put, you know, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put the title. You make your own decision on whether or not you want to go to Vlad's channel. My only point in bringing it up is that it highlights exactly what I'm talking about, right? In terms of the sexual objectification of boys, because this kind of thing cannot be imagined with, you know, a group of women or any individual woman talking about her violation and being and really being expected to entertain while talking about it. But it happens with black men and it goes in one ear and out the other, because, again, the sexual objectification of black men is acceptable, even within African-American culture. This is one of the things that needs to be outright identified and challenged by black men themselves. Because at the end of the day, we're the only ones who can. And if we don't give a damn, no, nobody else is. So this is the kind of thing that our boys in particular need to be shielded from, not only in terms of how acceptable it is to even joke about on places like Twitter, you know, or, uh, you know sites like Twitter or whatever, but in terms of the actual experience of it. Because when I was sexually, sexually violated as a boy, my parents had no frame of reference that that could happen. None. And this is what I mean. We don't have a frame of reference for it for the boys. We damn sure don't have it for the men. And it continues. Gay, straight, doesn't matter. Still happens. Black males are considered, it's considered acceptable. Now, one of the other components or things I want to share with you about this is when I teach this in my classes, uh, I talk about this in terms of stereotype. Let me enlarge this a little bit for you. I talk about it in terms of stereotype because we have to understand that the sexualization of black men isn't arbitrary. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It actually comes out of popular stereotype. Now, it just so happens that this two slides 
has two stereotypes that I engage in the class and then we discuss, the noble savage and the Mandingo. Now the noble savage was, was a stereotype that you also saw attributed to Native American men, most particularly. I'm not really talking about the noble savage right now. I'm talking more about the Mandingo. Now, historically, right, the Mandingo was known as a hypersexual beast um, who was un unable to restrain himself, particularly around white women. He also was said to have a beastly sized genitalia. Uh, and, and basically, this justified his, his intellectual inferiority. And it's still popular today, right? And then for the most part, when you look at the legacy of lynching when it comes to Black men, the overwhelming reason behind lynching was sexual. It was accusations of Black men violating white women. Now, the image in the middle is of a porn star who named himself Mandingo. And this kind of shows you in a, in a particular way how popular the concept is. He knew what he was doing. Now, I can also say that, now, even though I ain't seen him in years, this was my roommate in college. So shout out to my boy. I hope he's well. I don't know if he's still in the business, but he was quite popular for a while. So shout out to him. But even the, cho the choosing of that name. And of course, you got in the top left image from the film in 1976 titled Mandingo. Right. This is a black man on the auction block, you know, during a slave film. And of course, you have a white woman checking his genitalia. Right. So this concept of the Mandingo under my, undergirds how we're perceived, how we're talked about and so on. And I would even argue that these these kinds of attitudes about black, black men are global. They pretty much are. I mean, even to this extent that I've traveled out of the country, I've seen these stereotypes alive and well as they apply to black men. Now, here's the twist. Here's the twist. In some instances, even though you have these stereotypes that apply to black men, they can be the beginning point of a meeting with black men and women from other cultures. It doesn't necessarily have to stay limited, limited to that in individual relationships, but it is nonetheless a reality that black men face, whether we're aware of it or not, whether we take advantage of it, whether we ignore it, doesn't matter. The fact that it's there is that it's the weird thing that people overlook is this type of sexual objectification is not limited to how whites see us, how other groups see us. And trust me when I tell you, other groups are well aware of these stereotypes. Matter of fact, I said this in the last show and I really did mean it. You'd be surprised how many women of other cultures are basically exiled by their men if they're found to interact with black men. And one dude, this is <laughs> at a conversation with a, a Latino brother about eight or nine years ago talking about this very subject. And I asked him why. And he said, because the men don't want to come after a woman after she's been with black men out of fear of size of his phallus and not measuring up. Now, that could have just been his opinion. I concede that. But that isn't the only time I've heard that. Right. These stereotypes can affect how black men are perceived, and they often do. But the weirdest part is that they also affect how we're even treated within our own communities. And you listen to how women describe what they want, especially when they get explicit. Conversation around black men and what's expected of us doesn't veer much different than listening to white supremacists talk about black men. In some instances, I'm not saying this is across the board for all black women. We we'll still do this uh, no walt thing. But anyway, but the reality is it's there. And what you saw with this little boy being sexualized at five years old is telling because when they start talking about he can get it and what they want to do with him sexually, where else do you think these ideas come from? Black men are valued on the basis of our sexuality, even within our own community. And it's okay as long as it happens by people who deem it okay. I really should say it's okay as long as black men allow it. And I'm glad to be in an era where I'm seeing more black men speak out and boys, for that matter, about this than I've ever seen. I applaud it. I support it. And I want to add this video to the discussion so that hopefully for some people who are either dealing with it now or have dealt with it in the past and don't realize they have, didn't know how to interpret it, to give them an opportunity to reframe. Because we didn't benefit from decades of lifetime movies highlighting what exactly Black men have experienced. We were just told, eh, as one feminist told me, that's just that black male shit. Meaning that if you were sexually violated, 
because it was assumed that you would be sexually pleasurable to a woman, even if you were still a child, it was okay. Because that's just shit black men go through. It's not even worth talking about. And this was a professor in Africana studies, feminist. That's how she dealt with it. And she's not alone. So anyway, just wanted to put that out there, give us something to think about. And talk about um, in regard to this and really kind of frame what exactly black men are experiencing. Now, again, as usual, I want to hear your comments and I want to see what you have to say. And most importantly, I'm interested in what experiences you're willing to share that might, you know, relate to some of the things we talked about today. Yeah, exactly. Spain, man, shut up and lay the pipe. Real talk. Anyway, that's what it is. Just wanted to drop that word. Hope you guys have a good night and I look forward to your comments. Y'all have a good one. Peace.